Hello and welcome to CIPR TV. I'm Russell Goldsmith and this is my co-host Stephen Waddington. Now, for regular viewers expecting to see Philip Sheldrake in this seat, Philip is currently chairing the Internet of Things conference and so as a fellow member of the CIPR social media panel, I've been drafted in to step into his shoes for today's show. Today we welcome Richard Miller. He's the UK CEO of Helen Knowlton. He's our guest to talk about all things internal communications and retail PR. Richard is a senior com consumer marketing practitioner that has crossed from agency to in-house and back again. He was pre previously consumer marketing UK practice head and leader of H&K's retail practice with clients including B&Q and Sainsbury's. He's also spent a spell of almost eight years in-house at Habitat. Now, if you've got a question you'd like to put through to Richard, you can still send it into the studio using the form below the video player you're watching us on. Just enter your question, press send, and if you can tell us your name and where you're from, that would be great because we'd love to give you a name check. And don't forget, you can also send in comments and follow the show on Twitter. So if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag hash CIPRTV. Now, before we kick off our interview with Richard, since our last show, we've seen the launch of I by The Independent. That's the first national newspaper launch for almost a generation. And for those who haven't seen it, Stephen's got a copy yeah. with him here. Um, what's your thoughts? Um, so, I love it. I love it for two reasons. I started my, my career out in, in print journalism, so, you know, it, it's delightful to see a new national newspaper for, for the first time in, in 15 years. Um, I also love it because it's so contrary to everything we, we know about print at the moment. It's supposedly in decline, so The Independent is being very, very brave launching at this time. Um, it's clearly taken its influence uh, from the web. Apparently, there's an iPad app in the uh, version in the, in the works. I haven't seen that yet. But uh, the, the, the use of infographics, short form text, uh, tables, uh, and just the visual presentation is absolutely fantastic. It's clearly aimed, aimed at the younger web uh, generation. Opportunities for PR? Uh, opportunities for PR, there's t tons of them. Like it's another another national media outlet, and we haven't had one of those for for for, for a long time. The Independent is is being brave, as I say. Um, it's clearly a volume game. It's got to get the distribution sorted out. There's a big advertising campaign supporting it, and you know, you've got to wish it luck. Uh, and 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 it's a really really brave move. Um, I got one for you actually. Yep. Um, Broadcast, and yes. we saw the strikes last week with the the, the BBC News uh, had all manner of uh, impact. And potentially on. next week as well. So uh, it's Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, all manner of impact on on news schedules for for the BBC. PRs pitching into broadcast. What the hell do you do? Well, obviously, I mean, we're a broadcast agency, so there is an impact on on trying to fill a, a schedule. I, th I think um, a couple of things to to consider really. One is try and forward plan as much as you can. Um, um, obviously the impact, um, bearing in mind it's NUJ, so it's, it's news. Um, so nationally you're looking at today, Five Live and, and obviously rolling news regionally. From what we've seen, more impact on the north than in, in, in the south. So in the northeast, we uh, saw uh, all our news coming out of Yorkshire, yeah. which was absolutely bizarre. Absolutely, exactly. So I think things to consider, and, and this is what we tell clients constantly, is come away from this concept of, a, of your broadcast campaign being a radio day where your spokesperson's right. only available for a, a set day and a certain amount of time. You know, you have to be flexible um, so that you don't end up, you know, being impacted should th that happen. Um, the other thing, obviously, is, is do exactly what we're doing here so as, as well as the media right? exactly yeah. as well as using traditional media to, to get your yeah. story out become the media owner if you've got a spokesperson and, and, and you know and a story well let's talk get to your audience directly camera, through, yeah. yeah through the internet exactly as we're doing with CIPR right. TV so um, great time to, to bring in Richard Richard uh, talking about the BBC uh, in conflict with the mm -hmm. strike situation yeah. it's not the only organization think of the RMT fire brigade mm -hmm. at the moment um, what's the role of internal comms, one of your specialisms, in a, in a situation like that? Well, essentially, you've got two strategies in opposition. You've got a, one strategy where conflict is escalated to win, <coughs> and a second strategy in opposition, which is dialogue creation to win. And at the centre of that, you've got the employee, who really needs to make a, a call between probably a highly emotional argument on the one side and a very rational argument on the other. But my view is you never underestimate the intelligence of that employee to make the right decision in that situation. So effective communications from both sides is absolutely critical. Okay, well, we've got a lot of questions obviously to get through. Um, 
the show was going to run for about 15, 20 minutes. So we're going to sort of chop and change on, sure. on, on um, topics. There's one here looking at High Street, because obviously, as, as uh, Stephen said in his intro, as well as internal comms, we've got retail PR to cover. The British Retail Consortium said, yes, yeah, this is a question that's here. The British Retail Consortium said yesterday that confidence was down in October. How do you read the market, Richard, in the run up to Christmas? If I was to answer that question with a simple answer, I would say I think Christmas will be good, <clears throat> but I think it's going to be a mixed a mixed story for different retailers. So I think the grocers have had and continue to have a fairly good time. Mm. I think you, in the fashion sector, you've got a very strong performance from the fast fashion end of the high street and also the premium end of the high street. Within high ticket items in electrical goods and furniture, it's been a much bumpier ride and will continue to be a bumpy ride through Christmas and into the new year. So I, you know, a simple answer, Christmas good, but each sector within the retail sector, I think, has a different story to tell. So it's a market of many markets. It's a market of many markets, uh, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned that white, uh, white goods. Um, there's the VAT increase coming in January. Yes. Um, but now, some commentators are actually saying that's going to be, that's going to fuel the market in, in the lead up to Christmas. But but actually after Christmas, you know, there's, there's going to be we're going to see a, a recession. And some people have almost some economists have said it's almost certainly been baked in. Um, what's your view on that? And, and you know, and, and for PRs uh, working in in the retail sector, well, I think I think for sure sales are going to be pulled forward this side of Christmas as a consequence of that VAT rise. Uh, and I think that many retailers are considering their strategies in response to that. But let's not forget, it's not just the VAT rise that's going to impact the retail sector. You know, we're seeing rises in cost of raw materials, cotton, which is going to affect the fashion industry, mm. food inflation will, inflate, will, will affect the grocers too. And that puts huge pressure on um, retailers to respond. Uh, and I think there are, there are different opportunities. I mean, obviously, more for less is going to be a very strong proposition any retailer needs to communicate to its consumer. Uh, and that's not just cheaper goods, that's cleverer marketing. Right. right? Adding Jill Sander to the Uniqlo brand, that's more for less. Yeah. Um, I think the rhythm of business will be looked at. Um, Christmas is good, but for a DIY retailer, Easter is more important than Christmas. So mm. post Christmas, those, those businesses will be very heavily focused. And then I think the third piece, which comes back to the internal comms piece, is the role of service and the employee to drive retail sales. So, so on that last point, have you any standout examples of uh, companies on the high street you think are doing it well, responding well to these austerity well, pressures? One of the, as you mentioned, I, I had seven years client side working for Habitat, and I, I learned a huge amount, not just being client side, but someone I regard as my mentor is Ingvar Kamprad, who is the uh, founder of IKEA, um, hmm. and at the time was the owner of Habitat. And he taught me a very important lesson, um, which was simply this. I have three parts of my business, my stores, my products, and my people. Anyone can copy my products, anyone can copy my stores, but no one can copy the culture that I've created amongst my people who face my customer. Well, that's interesting you say that, because what, what about, I mean, the sort of concentration on Christmas at the moment, and over the last few years, we've seen more and more sales going through online. Sure. What's the impact then in terms of, you know, obviously you haven't got that people-facing side, and we've talked about, um, you know, high street retailer. Can you see the impact, uh, what the impact will be from an online point of view in terms of over Christmas, and how that impacts on the high street? Well, I think... Online is, is very much a convenience purchase. You know, the personality of the brand still needs to be delivered mm. through the online experience. Right. And that could be the guy who delivers the product okay. to your home at the end right, of yeah. that purchase process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, questions coming through, and we're um, incredibly we're already halfway through, so we're going to try and get through as many as we can here. Um, measurement in the PR industry is rightly receiving a lot of attention of late. Um, so this actually leads nicely on from you know, talking about retail. How is sales data used in the retail industry to inform campaigns? Well, let me tell you, I had seven years working for a retailer. Every Sunday night, about 11.30 p.m., my mobile phone would bleep. And yeah. It would give me the weekly sales number. Right. Which inevitably informed my agenda on a Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Mm. 
So I think it's one of the sectors where the immediacy of retail sales very much drives the comm strategy. Okay. Do you want to take that next one? Uh, so you, you mentioned the, your experience at Habitat. Um, you, you've had big, big jobs in-house and an and agency side, HK we talked about. Um, how do they differ and, and which do you prefer? <laughs> I need me ask me to make a call on that, <laughs> um, and I will probably sit on the fence uh, and say that I've enjoyed them and I enjoy this one as much as I enjoyed the client side experience. But they're very, very different, um, and they're very different um, because I think client side you have a much broader spectrum of the different component parts of a business, which you right. learn hugely from, and it it makes you a better salesman because let me tell you when you're trying to sell a comms concept through a retail operator or a buyer or a merchandiser, that's a much harder sell than selling it to another comms expert. Conversely, I think on the, the agency side was the, primarily the reason I came back is that you know, you're surrounded by people who have a very similar outlook, who have lots of energy, stimulates a more creative environment in terms of specialism. So, so graduates coming out onto the market now and, and perhaps people early in their career, should they be looking for to, to get both agency and in-house expertise? Does it create a better, more rounded, balanced professional? Do you think? Again, a simple answer to that, yes. Um, and I certainly, in leading my agency, are increasingly looking to pull people across from, from client-side uh, experience. I've just hired a, my chief operating officer who's had 25 years in the healthcare sector on the corporate side. Um, and that brings real value to our clients as well as, well as our people. Um, what I'm also very keen on is, is seeing some of my people go into the client's organisation on a secondment right. to learn yeah. firsthand about the challenges and pressures of working client side. Well, I think that's a nice time to bring in the next question because you're talking about your own team mm -hmm. at, at Hill and Knowlton. Um, and I, I read about this um, obviously a couple of months ago, the change management project, management project that, that you're going through at the moment. Um, so the question here is, you're responsible for the change management project at Hill and Knowlton that will see the business move to sector-based model. What's driving this change? Is there anything you can sort of tell us without <laughs> breaking What's too much confidentiality in-house? In I mean, in very simply, cli <coughs> clients primarily are driving that change and talent is driving that change. And mm -hmm. from the client side, um, what is it, is it worth explaining just the model? And yeah, simply, what, what Hill and Knowlton has done in the last 12 months is move from a practised based organisational model to a sector based. So, so that, that, model. that's you have Marcoms, internal comms, so we had different disciplines to an organisation organised by industry. around eight industry sectors. Right, okay, yeah. Within each of those sectors, what I have, can deliver to the clients is all of those practices, right. but with deep sector expertise yeah. attached to it. Right. Um, and that is. The, Primarily because the, the the change that we've seen over the last five years is the need for, for seamless integrated communication across all audiences. And my fear when I, were, when I inherited the agency um, two years ago was that we were in practice camps yeah. and that the integration of those um, practices was not as effective as it should have been mm. from a client perspective. So, so we see um, d d digital's often are often framed in in this discussion. Do you, do you have digital as a, a discrete bolt on Absolutely skill, not. or Absolutely is it not. Digi so, so digital it's is fully integrated across yeah. the organisation? And when we took that decision during the middle part of last year, um, it, it's not a it's not an adjunct. It's not a choice mm. to make. It's absolutely what we do. It's at the centre of what we do, so it has to be integrated across. And how many staff the business. do you have? How many employees across the, the thing? Well, I have, in terms of digital... Uh, so, no, in, in H&K that's going through this whole process? H&K, we have 225 okay. people. So, I mean, I don't know if that's... Because that's a nice time to pick up on this, this yeah, next we question. We start with internal term. communications. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you're clearly rolling out a big change management project here. What's the role of internal comms within that? Um, significant. Um, the, it starts, starts very, very much with a clear purpose yeah. um, to follow. Um, but more importantly than that, you know, this is a, this is a two-way dialogue. And the dialogue started a year before the change was announced. So that when the change was announced, all of the employees in Hill and Knowlton were, were almost f ready for the change to be announced because they've been part of the dialogue. 
that had identified what the need was and what the solution to that need should be. So the communication had started 12 months, mm -hmm. effectively, before the change was announced. Right. Um, and leadership of that change had been distributed around the organisation well before the change was announced. So this became very much part of the way the business was evolving rather than a moment in time where we went from this organisation yeah. to this organisation. Yeah. And you got the buy-in? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Probably not the best person to ask. <laughs> we, so uh, you know, we, we've got a question from uh, Kat Smith on, on, on the back of this. It's a great follow-on question. What's an agency going to look like in 10 years' time? Very different, I think, first mm. and foremost. Um, I think it will look different, not just organisationally, but I think the skill sets and the capabilities that an agency will need to present to its client will look very different. Um, and I think that the, the, the great debate inside our industry at the moment is you know, the camps that have been traditionally advertising, direct marketing, PR, sales promotion, digital, will, will, will have to be removed. Yeah. Um, and you know, the great debate about who owns the future is the one that um, we're all engaged in. The one thing that really worries me most about our industry, the PR industry, is when we sit back, or other agency heads sit back and say, we own the future. Yeah. No one owns the future. Yeah. 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 I mean, quite frankly, any one of those agencies, disciplines, can own the future. It just needs to be able to react in the most appropriate way in response to the client's yeah, agenda. I mean, you know, we can look back over, to, over time and, uh, and opportunities missed by um, the PR industry and you know, that's, uh, it's a tragedy in itself but undoubtedly there is an yeah. opportunity at this point in time to grab hold of, of, of digital and the future of fragmented yeah. media, whatever that looks like. Talked about, the, uh, talked about what, what an agent, uh, agency might look like, what's, what's in, an in-house role going to look like in the future? Much more integration presumably with the rest of the business, you'd hope. Yeah, I think one of the debates in-house at the moment that I hear from both my clients and, and, and more broadly is the hierarchy of the comms officer and the marketing officer, um, which in some organisations are more closely aligned than others and some are very distinctly mm. non-aligned. Uh, and I think there's a, there will be over the, the, probably the next two to three years um, a significant shift in that dynamic and we've seen only in the last three months, you know, businesses like Nissan, Renault, bringing those two functions together. But interestingly, given the um, more senior role to the marketing director. And I think, right. Yeah. A um, bit of future gazing. Um, the, we've got a question here, which is hopefully um, a, a little bit, uh, you know, not so far in the future because it's talking about post-recession. So let's hope this isn't too far away. Um, and this is probably the last question we've got uh, time for. Um, this is from Jack Bryan. How will the PR landscape look post-recession? So let's, let's hope that's not too, too far down the line. What will the PR landscape look, look like post-recession? Post What's your thoughts on that? Um, you're presumably optimistic for the future. I'm right? very optimistic yeah. for the future. Yeah. Um, I think the, the challenge that we have constantly is is to just is simply to demonstrate the value of PR to to the the clients and, and to the broader community. Mm. Um, Comes back to that measurement point, doesn't it? In terms yes, of absolutely. And we we as a discipline, I think, have been very responsive through the recession um, to the challenges our clients have faced, and I think that will. That will only continue. I think the bigger question is what, what does post recession mean in this market? Yeah. You know, we're not, I don't think we'll, we're, in the short term, we're not going to go back to the days of clients delivering double digit growth on our budgets. Mm. So we're going to have to simply have to work harder and smarter and more intelligently to deliver creative solutions. Well, I think that's, that's a good time. To, to stop because I'm being told that uh, we've actually run out of time. Um, so that obviously only remains for us to, to thank you for watching um, and for all your tweets and questions during the show. Um, We'd also like to thank, thank Richard and the editorial production team here at Marketeers 4DC. We're back at five on December the 1st. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.